Hello, uh, my name is Phil. I'm the priest in charge of the Draycott and Lem Valley Benefice. And this is my sermon for the 25th of September, 2022. Uh, I'll just pray for us as we begin. Lord God, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. We pray you'll bless us as we reflect on it, that you may challenge us, encourage us and change us. Amen. Uh, so it's a little bit different uh, to usual this week in our video um, because uh, we've hit harvest season and what we're doing uh, throughout harvest, we've got nine different harvest services uh, going on across the benefits. Uh, four of them are taking place as part of our All Sorts stream. Uh, so uh, we're going to pop up the videos from All Sorts um, for the four harvest services. And it's going to be a bit of a... Um, a bit of a sermon series really. So each of those four weeks we'll be looking at the parable of the sower uh, which appears in um, three of the Gospels. Uh, if you're not familiar with the parable of the sower do look um, at Barbara's sermon which is online from last week. That was the first one in this series uh, where she read the parable um, as part of her sermon. Uh, it's the parable of the man who goes to sow seed, who throws it everywhere and it falls on four different types of soil. And each of those types of soil is an analogy for different ways of responding to Jesus and the word of God. Uh, so I'm sort of gonna pick up where Barbara left off. So Barbara last week was talking about the seeds that fell on the path. And when it fell on the path, the birds came and ate it up. Do, like I say, do check out that video, it's on our Facebook page my YouTube page, you'll know where that is because that's where you're watching me. So if you haven't seen Barbara's talk from last week, uh, do check that out and that'll give you a bit more background to the parable that we're thinking about. And it'll tell you about that first type of seed, which I'm not going to talk about uh, this morning. I'm going to pick up where Barbara left off and talk about the second seed uh, that fell um, in that parable. And that's the seed that fell in the rocky places uh, that had no root. Now, Barbara um, is from a farming background, so she could share with you lots of information about farmers and how they do, in fact, scatter their seed and sow their seed. Uh, I'm sure probably most of you watching this will know more about farming than me. Uh, you all live in rural area, in a rural area. I've only been here nine months. I was an urbanite till about nine months ago. Uh, so I'm not going to bother talking to you about farming because I know nothing about farming. And instead, I'm going to tell you about something that I do know about and that's 1990s breakfast cereal adverts. I'm quite the connoisseur of 1990s adverts, particularly adverts for breakfast cereal. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, Shreddy's adverts from the uh, mid to late 1990s were the finest examples of this genre. So um, all of the Shreddy's adverts in the 1990s uh, kind of followed a similar pattern. And what they do is they portray a situation where there's someone getting hungry right in the middle of something important. Um, as someone who wears one of these, uh, one particular example that springs to mind is the vicar who's about to take the wedding. The bride's just gone up um, the aisle towards the altar when suddenly an animated blue blob appears and starts beating the vicar on the belly with a spoon, uh, chanting, hunger strikes. Uh, and the vicar would cry out in anguish, oh no, I forgot my shredders this morning. Uh, and the advert would end with the tagline, Shreddies keeps hunger locked up till lunch. As I say, I don't know much about agriculture and farming, uh, but it's my understanding that crops need roots to soak up the nutrients in the soil to feed themselves. So plants having roots is like a person eating shreddies in the morning. Whether you're a plant or a person, you need fuel to keep you going. Without the fuel, uh, you dry up and you wither up um, as you lose your energy and need a top up. Uh, that's what happened to the seed in that parable that fell on the rocky places. And Jesus says that in this analogy, the people who hear the word and at once receive it with joy, uh, but then have no roots, uh, only last a short time when trouble or persecution comes. They will quickly fall away. That's uh, what happens to the seed that falls on the rocky ground without any roots. So the question for this morning is how do we make sure that we're not like that seed on the rocky ground? How do we make sure that we have roots and we don't wither away in the sun? And I'm going to explore that this morning 
by switching from the parable itself to Psalm 1. Uh, part of me wonders if this psalm might have been part of the inspiration for this parable that Jesus told. So I'm going to read Psalm 1 and then we'll have a little think about what this psalm has to say uh, about the seed that fell on the rocky ground and had no roots. So like I say, it's Psalm 1 and it's a really short psalm, just six verses. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. As I say, it's only a very short psalm, only six verses, uh, but kind of right in the middle, right at the centre of this psalm in verse three, we're told that the person um, who follows the law of the Lord uh, it's like a tree planted by streams of water that they yield their fruit in season and the leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers that tree in this psalm describes the complete opposite of that seed in our parable the seed has withered and died due to lack of root but this tree in the psalm has come from a seed which landed on ground that was rich in nutrients there are streams of water nearby, which has made this soil really good soil and has meant the tree roots have sucked up all of those nutrients that the stream has brought into them. And as a result, this seed has grown into a big and tall tree that has luscious leaves in it and it yields lots of fruits in season. In the same way that Jesus' parable um, has these seeds as analogies for different ways that people respond to God. The tree in this psalm is offered as an analogy for the way that people might respond to God. So I think uh, that a good way of life is described in our psalm offers some guidance on how to ensure that we are like seed that has roots rather than the seed on rocky ground that has no roots. As I said, psalm, the psalm is only six verses long, but there's two really important pieces of advice on how to ensure that as followers of God, we have root. Firstly, in verse one, the psalmist advises us to watch the company that we keep. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. We were talking about this a little bit at our Bible book club last week, because at first glance, this might sound like an instruction to cut ourselves off from everyone who isn't a Christian kind of instruction to be part of a holy hubble, holy hubble, holy huddle. Uh, but I don't think that's quite what this is getting at. There are a lot of verbs in this verse. Walk in the step of the wicked, stand in the way that sinners take, sit in the company of mockers. So I think this is not so much about avoiding people who aren't Christians, so much as being careful of making sure we don't try to emulate other people's bad behaviour in the hope of ingratiating ourselves to them. My eldest daughter has just started secondary school and watching both of my daughters grow up, I'm very worried about peer pressure. You wonder what kind of ideas are being thrown around in their social circles and what kind of activities might, both, might they be encouraged to take part in. I would really, really love to be able to vet who is allowed to speak to my daughters but it's not really an option. So instead, as a parent, you kind of try and bring them up to know for themselves what is right and wrong in the hope that when those crunch points come, they will be wise enough not to be taken along by the crowd when the crowd is going somewhere bad. And I think that's what this psalm is getting at when it talks about not sitting in the company of mockers. It's not about shunning everybody who doesn't go to church. It's about being strong enough in your own convictions and understanding of the world so as to not be swayed by others who see the world differently. 
And it goes on to say how you might do this. And that's the second big idea in this path, in this psalm. Uh, verse two says, they delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on his law day and night. The law of the Lord in the context of the psalm uh, when it was written uh, would have been the Pentateuch and the first five books of the Bible. But I think it's fair to say that for us reading it now in the 21st century, that phrase, the law of the Lord, refers, refers to the whole Bible. The psalmist is saying that those who read and digest the word of the Lord are set up to follow in his ways and not be swayed down destructive paths by others. The person who takes time to read and study God's word is like the person who has shreddies in the morning. They are prepared for what is to come and they won't be distracted from doing what is right by outside influences. Outside influences like a giant blue blob hitting their bellies with a spoon. When the psalm talks about meditating on God's law day and night, uh, it sounds like we all need to give everything up, doesn't it? And become monks or nuns sat in a cell uh, with a candle and a Bible. Uh, but I don't think that's quite what it's getting at. It's about investing time in God's word, yes. Uh, and that's why I keep going on about Bible study courses and groups. Because actually that time spent studying the Bible together, learning how it slots together, and the context behind different passages puts us in a place that when we read the Bible uh, during a pause during the day or in a moment of quiet at night before we go to bed, we have that knowledge and that ability to understand it and to hear what it has to say to us today. The Bible was written in a very specific place at a specific point in history. And at first glance, there's a danger that we just skim over it. And when we do, it might seem uh, in some places a bit random and a bit irrelevant. But if we invest that time in learning about it and studying it, we will hear God speak through it. And when God speaks through the Bible, and I tell you this from personal experience, when God speaks to you through the Bible, it just kind of makes sense. There's so much wisdom in here. And when we follow the advice and the wisdom in here, it can really help us to flourish in our lives, to make wise decisions, to hold firm to God um, and to understand life and to not get swept away uh, in bad directions. When we make the time to learn about and study the Bible, we can be like that tree in our psalm rather than that seed that withered because it had no root. We, when we read the Bible and we're rooted and built up in Jesus through studying his words, we're kind of like that vicar who doesn't get hungry leading the wedding because he's had his shreddies and kept hunger locked up till lunch. The Bible is our way of keeping, maybe not hunger, but keeping uh, bad things, bad thoughts, uh, folly uh, locked up. Maybe not even just till lunch, just keeps it locked up. Uh, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for the gift of your words. We thank you for the wisdom contained within. We pray that you will help us to have the inspiration and the discipline to meet you in your word. That when we do, we may be rooted and built up in you, holding firm to the wisdom of the life you call us to. Amen.